Beringus, and uh, I recorded with a group known as the Rip Chords. Uh, this was back in the 60s, before many of you were born, probably. The purpose of the video that we're doing now is to clarify some of the historical background of the Rip Chords. There's been a lot of misinformation, a lot of distortion of who sang what, where did this group come from, who was actually on touring out on there on the road, and uh, so there's a lot of misinformation, and we're going to try to clear up during this segment. I just wanted to be a recording artist since I was a kid listening to the radio. I heard Frankie Lane and all these great singers and I thought, gee, I could do that. And uh, a <laughs> little arrogant at the time, I guess. Uh, but the point is, I always had this dream. Well, I got started uh, actually wanting to take guitar lessons, and I found this guitarist uh, in Hollywood. His name was Ray Pullman. Didn't know it at the time, but he turned out to be uh, part of what we will later refer to as the Wrecking Crew, quite a, quite a great instrumentalist. I made a dub. Uh, there was a song uh, that I had written with a friend of mine, Phil Stewart, uh, we had met in high school, and we wrote this song together, and we recorded it. It was called Raindrops, and it was a dub. It was, you know, just one of those little plastic records. We went throughout the streets of Hollywood trying to get a recording contract. The dub sounded pretty good, actually. Uh, but no matter where we went, RCA, Columbia, you know, all, all the record companies, none of them wanted anything to do with us. After being rejected by every recording company in Hollywood, uh, we, we really decided to call it quits. Well, one day I was sitting at the kitchen table and I was looking through some old 45s, you know, that I had collected over the years, and I noticed that there was a record by Jan and Arnie, which later morphed into Jan and Dean. But at that time, they were Jan and Arnie. They recorded for a recording company in Beverly Hills. They had left, because I knew now they were recording for another company in Hollywood called Dory Records. So I thought to myself, well, maybe Arwen Records needs a couple of, new, um, couple of new recording artists to take the place of Jan and Arnie, which were now absent. So I called Phil and said, hey, let's go down there to Beverly Hills and see if they won't take us on. But as it turned out, Phil said, no, we've had enough of this, I'm, I'm through. But I took a chance. I went down there with the old dub that we had. I went, <laughs> I went into Arwen Records and they played it and it was all scratchy now because it was about four or five years old. The, the vice president of this company said, well, let me, let me hold on to this and uh, let's see what we can do with it. Maybe we can do something. Well, lo and behold, what happened was that I didn't know it at the time, but this was Doris Day's company. It's called Arwen. It was also called Daywin. And uh, it turns out that Doris Day's son, Terry Melcher, was going to uh, be a producer, a, re a record producer over at Columbia, and they were looking for a new artist. He was only 20 years old, just a young guy. And we weren't much older. I was 22 at the time. So we went down there to audition, to make a long story short, we auditioned for Columbia Records and for Terry Melcher. And then they told us, well, we'll let you know, guys. And by the way, when we auditioned, it was just Phil and myself with his guitar. You know, we just singing together. And uh, so we didn't know what the outcome was going to be. But a couple of days later, I got a call from Terry Melcher at Columbia Records. And he said, welcome to Columbia Records. And oh, wow, we got a contract with the biggest recording contract or company in the world. This was amazing. So, and I got all excited. I had a dog, it got excited. My mom got excited. In fact, I was so excited. This is a true story. We, there was a, I was gonna brush my teeth and there was a, uh, a tube of Brill Cream. Uh, some of you may be familiar with that. It's a hair lotion type thing. I had hair back then. But anyway, uh, I grabbed that tube by mistake and started brushing my teeth. Yeah, <laughs> it was a mess. Ugh. So we got our first recording contract with Columbia Records and Terry Melcher in 1962. Our first recording session was in December of that same year, 1962. We recorded a couple of songs, but the one that came out the best was called Here I Stand. And that was released by Columbia in early 
1963. I think it was around March, if I remember correctly. And that song took off. Uh, we, we made the charts. That was a chart buster, and it went up the charts. In some parts of the United States, it went as high as number 16. So that's about as high as it ever got. Um, but that was a breakout record, and we were on our way. We got some invitations to go do some concerts. And Terry Melcher took Phil and I to San Francisco. That was a blast. And we also did a concert at the Hollywood Palladium. Our second release was a song called Gone. <laughs> and it was, uh, it was really sort of a hot rod song. But something happened during this recording session that's kind of interesting. We added another voice because Phil and I were the only ones that had been doing the singing. And actually on Here I Stand, I, I did, I'm not trying to brag here, but I basically did all the parts, the, the high, the falsetto, the lead, you know, the harmony. Um, and Phil did an under part, which was needed. Uh, but now in this second song called Gone, we added a third voice. This was a friend of Terry Melcher. His name was Bruce Johnston, who would later, incidentally, become a beach boy. But at this point in time, he was singing with us. When you hear the song Gone, you will really hear Bruce. He's got this fantastic falsetto. In fact, he and I shared falsetto parts all the way through on our recording sessions. He had a little bit of a different falsetto, though, and he could reach a note that I couldn't reach. I mean, he was up there in the stratosphere. He was really something else. And on the song Gone, when you get to the end of the song, you can hear him. He's taken off. It was great. The song didn't fare as well, though, as Here I Stand, even with the addition of Bruce. But it did get pretty high in some markets. In San Antonio, it reached number two, just underneath Elvis Presley. So anyway, after the release of Gone, we're looking for our third hit. And this is where we really have a problem. Uh, specifically myself, but the Rip Chords as a group also had a problem. I was going to Long Beach State University at the time, and I was studying to become a minister, and I had just graduated from Long Beach, so I was now headed for seminary, United Theological Seminary in Dayton, Ohio. But the church told me that I could not serve two masters, <laughs> so I either had to keep recording or get out and go to seminary. So what I did, uh, I took a leave of absence uh, just to see if the dust would settle. So I went back to United in uh, September of 1963 to start my educational studies. Specifically at that time, Terry Melcher got onto a song called Hey Little Cobra, and he liked that song. The problem was I wasn't there anymore, and Phil couldn't sing. Phil basically was a, a bass singer, so uh, he couldn't sing it, and, uh, and I was gone. So what happened was that Bruce Johnston and Terry Melcher cut that record. Hey, Little Cobra. Hey, Little Cobra, don't you know you're going to shut up down? I took my Cobra down to the track, hitched to the back of my Cadillac. Everyone was there just waiting for me. So the Hey, Little Cobra single went up the charts, uh, and it was very successful. Meanwhile, I was back in seminary, and Phil had given me a call, wanted me to come back and rejoin the group. So I told him, well, I don't know if I can do that, because the church is still, you know. So I met with the bishop of the 
Evangelical United Brethren Church, which I was a member of. And the bishop said to me, he said, well, Ernie, he said, you know, you're in a position where you might be able to do some good. I mean, you can talk to youth groups, you can do all kinds of, so I'm going to see if I can't have the ministerial board re reverse their opinion about you not recording. So in the meantime, he said, you go ahead and record. So I went back and I was recording with Phil, Terry and Bruce, the four of us did that entire Hey Little Cobra album. Look, look at my trophy machine, she's coming off the line. And look out for my trophy machine, top eliminator all the time. So anyway, the problem was solved. I am now recording again with my group, the Ripcords, yay! But I was still not allowed to go on tour. This was a problem. So who's going to tour with Phil? So what happened was they hired these two guys to go on tour with Phil. I think uh, Rich Rothkin and Arnie Marcus, that was their names. So they went out on tour with Phil while Phil, myself, and Terry and Bruce made the recordings in the studio. So the problem now is that we have two groups. We have a touring group and a recording group. And this is what really messes up our historical record. Because this is confusing. Nobody knows what's going on outside of the studio. They don't even know that Terry and Bruce are on the records. They're ghost singers. Now here's the point. From a legal standpoint, Phil and I are the only ones that are under contract to Columbia Records, and we're the only ones that receive the royalties. Yay! Pack it up, pack it up, buddy gonna shut you down. It happened on a strip where the road is wide. After doing the Hey Little Cobra album, I went back to seminary, and a few months later, I got a call from Terry. And uh, they had a new song they wanted to do, so I flew back out to the West Coast from Dayton. And uh, we recorded a song called Three Window Coop. It was a good song, and there's, uh, the four of us are doing that one too, Phil, myself, Terry, and Bruce. Uh, and then following that, we had to do the album. But anyway, on this album, it came out great. This, this actually was our best album. First of all, you got to hear the lead song on here, Three Window Coop. That's, that was, that made the charts. Beat em up, beat em up, shut em down. Three window coop, you're the toughest in town. Beat em up, beat em up, shut em down. Now, three window coop. And then the second song would be Bonneville Bonnie. This is Phil Stewart singing, and he does a great job. This, you'll hear his voice by himself. By the way, that's Glenn Campbell on the guitar. Bonneville Bonnie, the queen of the asphalt and down the highway of a fastback boat when a Pontiac passed me man it must have been flowed socket up exhaust from the dread Bonneville and I knew in a minute it was body at the wheel Whoa, now on the next song this little Woody this is where you hear Bruce Johnston on the falsetto listen to him when he comes in right at the start and, and you'll hear that beautiful soft falsetto tilt that he has <laughs> this little Woody she may not have the fastest time in town. One of the problems with the identity crisis that we find with the ripcords, who they were, who, who really sang on what, comes from the fact that all of the publicity, all of the pictures, the album covers, the CDs, have the pictures of the touring group, not the recording group. So people get a little confused. Who are these guys? For example, that's Phil. He was actually, he did sing with us, obviously. But Rich and Arnie here are the touring group, and they were not part of the recordings. But this is what everybody sees. It doesn't matter what album cover you pick up or what publicity, it's always the touring group. And so that's why people got messed up in terms of who we really were. I will say again, if you want to know who sang what on where when, uh, look at my website, uh, ripcords.info. All the information is there. And by the way, in 2006, Sundays with Columbia Records put out the CD called The Best of the Ripcords. Uh, and it really straightens out the whole thing about who sang what where and does definitely give credit to the four of us who sang on the original recordings. 
um, the California Sound, the Beach Boys, the Rip Chords, the Hondell, some of these groups that had this kind of what, what they now refer to as a California Sound. But I, wanted, I want you to know that Terry Melcher and Bruce Johnson, was, they were really a big part of that sound. And I don't think the Rip Chords uh, would have had the success they came to have without Bruce and Terry. They were a very, very uh, integral part of that group. Terry had a way of recording, very unique, and we would overdub our voices, but sometimes we would overdub somebody else's part, and they would overdub our part, and I would cover on a falsetto, or Bruce would cover on a falsetto, so it really got all messed up. Yeah, in her one piece, Let's listen to my big gun board. This is a composite lead of myself and Terry. And I'm doing the backgrounds along with the falsetto, but it's fairly much a group. But listen to this, big gun board. That's about a surfboard that's real big. <laughs> yeah, I'm figured out. Okay, long with a red and white fin. Sweet on my big gun board. You ought to see it take a drop, man, it really goes. I gotta walk along before I hang five toes. Yeah, my big gun board. <laughs> I'm gonna do a song called Surfing Craze. It's on the Three Window Coop album, and it's me singing by myself, and I'm doing the backgrounds with um, Phil, Terry, you know and Bruce. What happens every summer, the minutes cool us out. All the surfers and honeys start to scream and shout. And then there's a song called Gas Money, and I'm doing this by myself. It's just an album film. Well, anytime I'm in your car, no matter where or how we are, you try to get my cash, but you say you're out of gas, so we stay right where we are. I need some gas money. I need some gas money. Well, if you really want to go, you better come up with some dough. I need some gas money. Now listen to the saxophone. We're racing over, even out on the coast now. Give it a try, you're going to dig it the most now. Wind it out. Like most groups, we broke up. How did that happen? Well, the way it usually happens. You run out of material. <laughs> Nobody will play your stuff anymore. Uh, and we also had different uh, goals in mind. Terry wanted to produce other groups, which he did. He produced uh, Paul Revere and the Raiders, The Birds. I mean, he was a very successful producer. Uh, Bruce went on to be with the Beach Boys. Uh, Phil, he wanted to uh, become a soloist actually uh, in his own right and he wanted to go into western music and I wanted to pursue my educational studies and go into ministry. So eventually the demise of the group was very natural and it just came apart for those reasons. <laughs> hey little Cobra don't you know you're gonna shut them down I took my Cobra down to the track hitched to the back of my Everyone was there just a waiting for me There were plenty of stingrays and XK You know it happens every summer The minute school lets out All the surfers and honeys Start to scream and shout Camping out at the beaches They won't be home for a day Oh, my baby's name is Ken She's a girl that I adore And every day I love Little Deuce Coop, 